Hello friends, welcome once again to the Advent Media Connect. The message for the week is the science of repentance or the truth about repentance. We're going to study this matter today from the word of God and see how the Lord is speaking to you and I. I think we need this today. Before we get into the word, let us pause and have a word of prayer. Eternal Father, we pray that you will bless us now. We need your spirit. We need your guidance. May the word of God come alive once again. Use me for your glory. May the things that are spoken today will be a benefit to those who will be listening. We pray that Jesus will get the glory, the honor, and the praise. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Okay, let's get to it. So this is entitled The Truth About Repentance. We are studying the science of repentance. Let's begin. Telling the truth, making someone cry, is better than telling a lie, making someone smile. You'll see what I mean as we go through this. All right, let's begin. We are told in the book of John, chapter 8, 31 to 32, Then said Jesus to the Jews who believe on him, which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We want the truth from the word of God to come alive once again in our study today. Now, let's continue. We are studying today the truth about repentance. You know, repentance is one of those theologies all throughout scriptures that you will find people had one of the most difficult things to accept. Let's ask question number one. What is the most popular message found in the entire Bible? We are told King Solomon, we are told in 1 King Solomon chapter 8 verse 47, if they shall be think we are told themselves in a land whether they shall they were carried captives. Here's the word: repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives. So during the dedication of the temple, King Solomon places emphasis on the word repentance. And again, in the book of Job, we find this: the patriarch Job. Job 2, verse 6 tells us that 42 verse 6, wherefore I abhor myself. And what else? And repent in dust and ashes after God had revealed himself. We are also told in the book of prophet uh, Ezekiel, for example, the prophet Ezekiel speak about repentance. He says in Ezekiel 14, verse 6, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, repent, turn away from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. So you see it all throughout the Old Testament. You move to the New Testament. Here comes Jesus in Mark, in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. And here's the next word again. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So the most popular message that we find throughout the entire Bible is a message of repentance. You move into the book of Revelation. This is what we begin to find. We find seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamus, Thyatira, Sidus, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. One thing these message, all these churches have in common, apart from Philadelphia, is, is this major word. And again, remember, therefore, from henceforth that art fallen to Ephesus, repent. And we find also in Pergamus, repent. And in Thyatira, the same word. Repent. And in Sardis, what do you find in Sardis? As you read, you will find the same word once again is pronounced. And there it is. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast. Next word, repent. And in Laodicea, we are told also, for as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And again, what you find, the word repentance for at least six of these churches, apart from Philadelphia, all of them needed to repent from one type of sin to another. So at the same time, while this is a popular message in the Bible, it is an unpopular message in the culture. This is one of the most hated message in the entire world. 
We are told also in, uh, uh, this is St. Augustine of Hippo, and I want you to hear what he says. God has promised forgiveness to your repentance, and he has not promised tomorrow to your procrastination, somebody. Augustine went on to say, repentance is never out of season. It is as frequently used as the artifice tools of the soldier's weapon. Mm. Charles Spurgeon said this, because God is slow to anger, we are slow to repentance. Is the call of repentance a message of hate? And I think while this message is heavily misunderstood, but is the call of repentance a message of hate? Let's go to the Bible to see whether or not these things are so. The call to repentance is often rejected. Why is it rejected? Because it is misunderstood. When God is calling sinners to repentance, it always feels like God is hating on you. Or the person who's bringing the message, that individual just hates you. But this is not the case. It is often rejected because often it's understood. For example, in the days of Noah, God wanted to save the interdiluvian world. And he told Noah, build an ark. If the people would have repented and entered into the ark of safety, there would have never been a flood. This was a message of love, but it was misunderstood. Prophet Jeremiah was sent to the people of Israel before the Babylonian captivity. We are told again and again, the men sounded the alarm that the people of God should repent and submit themselves to the Babylonians because God had a plan. And again, they misunderstood the message and persecuted God's man. We are told also when Prophet Elijah went to Ahab and Jezebel to sound the alarm of repentance, they persecuted him as well. Jezebel said, I will, <laughs> listen, I will have him dead. He had to flee for his life. John the Baptist got his head cut off because he preached the message of repentance. Misunderstood, rejected once again. Jesus almost got stoned, even thrown down a hill because he preached the message of repentance. All throughout scripture, you will find while this is the most popular message and yet it is the most misunderstood, most hated, the most rejected message in the entire Bible. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, we are told, For as many as I love, the Bible says, repentance is not a message of hate. God is looking to save sinners from sin. Therefore, he sent a message of repentance in the hope that people will listen, believe, and be saved. We are told the message of repentance is a message of love. It is an appeal from God. This is God's love appeal to humanity. And we are told that repentance is a gift. In Romans 2 verse 4, And despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of the Lord leadeth thee to repentance. It is a gift to have the desire to want to repent. It is not natural. So what kind of people should be called to repentance? What kind of people should be called to repentance? Class number one, sinners. Sinners. We are told in the Bible, in Luke 5, 31 and 32, Jesus answered and said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, what else? But sinners to repentance. So who gets the call of repentance? Sinners. So if you believe you are a sinner, as we all are, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, the message of repentance is for you. But there are some people who believe they are good. They don't need repentance, right? They are okay. Well, Jesus says, I never came for you. So we are told the second group of people that God is calling to repentance is what I refer to as the common people. The common people. 
Who are the common people in Acts 17, 30, in the time of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commendeth all men everywhere to repent. So that means all men, irrespective of who you are, where you're from, your skin color, your, uh, uh, your whether you are of diverse groups or status and finance. Listen, God is calling every man everywhere. So that also is an international call. International call means it doesn't where it doesn't matter which part of the world you're from. The message of repentance from God is for you. And then we are told, earthly rulers, mm, earthly rulers. Now you can say they were included in part of the man, all men. Yeah, sure they were. But earthly rulers, to be more specific, oftentimes don't think that they need to repent because they are in position of trust. But I'll show you in the Bible, God will send his men to call earthly rulers to repentance as well. We are told that the book of Daniel, he confronted a man named Nebuchadnezzar. What did Daniel do to Nebuchadnezzar? Well, this is what he did. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. Break off thy sins by righteousness. That's a call to repentance. Because why? Thine iniquity by showing mercy to the poor, that he may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Well, we are told he rejected that message. He went crazy for seven years. The message of repentance and appeal of love from God was rejected by the ruler. And guess what? It cost him greatly. But after seven years, he got his act together. We are told even more religious leaders. Oh, come on, Pastor James. Pastors too? Yes, friends. Not just earthly and political leaders. No, even religious leaders must be called to repentance. We are told in the book of Mark 3, 7 and 8, we are told this is John the Baptist preaching and he saw many and the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to the baptism and he saith unto them, O generations of vipers who have warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. So even religious leaders had to repent sometimes. Oh, many times I should say. So who should we call to repentance? We are told the sinner, the common people, governmental leaders or earthly rulers or religious leaders. So that means everybody must repent. God is calling every man everywhere to repent. So now let's read on. Question number four. If one desires to be saved, what is the first thing he will need to do? Now, if you want to be saved, you want to be saved in God's kingdom, what is that first thing that you need to do today? We are told in Acts chapter 2, 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And there goes the attitude of a man who wants to be saved. And with this attitude, God will do an amazing work. Let's see what the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter answered and said unto them, what is that word? Repent. Here is the word again. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So now, we are told the moment the people were pricked in their heart and they were convicted by the message of Peter, they asked the major question that, which is, what shall we do? And the answer was to repent. And they did. And we're baptized. So if you want to be saved today, step number one, you need to repent. I need to repent. There is no salvation outside of repentance. You cannot get in. You cannot go under. You cannot go above without repentance. Friends, we are told furthermore, what is repentance? What is repentance? In Ecclesiastes chapter 14, verse 6, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abomination. We are told in the next verse in Ezekiel 18, 30, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways. Say of the Lord, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruined. So there is a warning here that if a person chooses not to repent, they will be ruined by their iniquity. And this is why this message is so significant. 
In Isaiah chapter 116, we are told, wash you and make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment and relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless and plead for the widow. And this is what happens when a person repents. Cease to do what is wrong and learn to do what is right. So now let's talk a little bit more about what the definition of repentance is. So what is repentance? Here is my definition. Some people can say 180 degrees and change this. Listen, here is the definition I want to give you. You can work with that, right? Repentance is a change of mind produced by godly sorrow that results in a reformation of life. Let me read that again. What is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind produced by godly sorrow that results in a reformation of life. Note, repentance is important before one becomes a Christian and after he becomes a Christian, the process of repentance continues. Yes, friends. Sometimes we think, oh, I'm, a, I'm in the church. I'm in, I'm, I'm in Christ. I'm part of a local church. I'm active and I'm engaged. I'm doing evangelistic outreach. The Lord knows me and the people knows me, right? I'm baptizing souls. You are not beyond repentance because you're a Christian. There is a progression to repentance as well. There are some more stuff God is going to show you as you journey in this walk of faith that you're going to have to repent from. Let's get back to our study. Question number six. And here's the question. What are the five R's? Five R's of repentance. Now, I'm going to give you five words that start, uh, each one of them start with the word R. And we're going to build on that foundation. Are you ready? All right. Let's begin. Number one, received. Number two, remorse. Number three, reverse. Number four, reformation. Number five, restitution. All right, let's get to it. Receive. What is it that we need to receive? The sinner needs, needs to receive. Sorry about this. I'm missing the word. I'm missing a word. The sinner needs to receive the information that he needs to repent. So the first thing you need is to receive that information. What is that information? We are told in Mark, in Matthew 3, verses 1 and 2, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This was the information. The forerunner of Christ says, Listen, Jesus is coming. God's kingdom of grace and glory is about to be here. You guys need to repent. That information needed to be made clear before the people of God. We are told in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What is that information that they need to receive? You have sinned. Sin is law breaking. In 1 John 3, 4, the Bible says, whosoever committed sin, transgressive also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Why should one repent? Because he needs to receive the information. What's the information? All have sin, including me, including you, including those around us. So therefore, we need to repent. And why is this supposed to be something important? Because the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. So if one chooses not to repent, death will be the ruin. So therefore, and you might be asking, what kind of death are we talking about? Listen, this is hellfire. The Bible refers to that as the second death. The second death. And that I do not wish on my worst enemy. In Ezekiel 33, verse 11, say unto them, as I live, save the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, and why will you die, O house of Israel? And I'm telling you today, some of God's people need to receive that message of repentance that they may turn and fall in line with God's way. The second thing needed in the process of repentance, the second R, is what I refer to as remorse. 
Having heard the message doesn't save you. <laughs> you need this. Here is what the Bible says. When one is truly convicted of sin, this will produce godly sorrow, which will, be, which will lead him to repentance. Without this, there is no true repentance. We are told this is something that the Spirit of God does in the heart as the message has been proclaimed. We are told, for example, David, when he sinned, what did God do with his prophet he sent the prophet to him and said you are the man this was a direct message for david for his sin it was an appeal of love as well david understood that message and he repented we are told in acts chapter 2 verse 36 therefore let all the house of israel how assuredly that god have made the same jesus whom you have crucified both lord and christ and this was a direct targeted message to the people of the time and we were told as a result of that they were prick in their hearts and said unto peter and the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do in other words conviction remorse were settling in this is why the message have to be directed to the individual so that the holy spirit can bring about remorse in the heart we are told very clearly that in second corinthians chapter 7 verse 10 for godly sorrow worketh repenting unto salvation not to be repented of but the sorrow of the world worketh death so we need what is it that we need to be repenting we need godly sorrow that's that remorse. Peter knew what that was like. He thought he will, he will endure the temptations. But we are told under pressure, Peter fell apart. But Jesus looked at him from across the room and his heart was broken. And he started weeping. Peter has never been the same ever since. Never been the same. We all thought in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 13, and David said unto Nathan, I mean, 2 Samuel 12, verse 13, David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. This is the attitude of a man who wants to repent. Not against everybody else. It's not anybody else's fault. I'm not, I'm not even going to blame the devil. Although he's led me into a position where I've sinned against God. But what David is doing here, friends, he is taking the appeal and the call from God unto himself. And he's accepting the message and say, Lord, I'm guilty. I have done wrong in the sight of God. Stop blaming the church. Stop blaming some family members. No, don't talk about your parents, your, your dysfunctional home. No, no, no. I have sinned against the Lord. I'm guilty of my sins and no one else is to be blamed for it but me. This is where God can really work in the heart. We are told furthermore in Psalms 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken of a contrite heart. Oh God, thou will not despise. What does God look for in the heart? A broken spirit, a broken a contrite heart. God wants that in order to save the man. We are told in Psalm 34, verse 18, the Lord is nigh unto them that have a broken heart and save it such as be of a contrite spirit. God loves broken hearts. God loves contrite spirits. He's able to work with them. Why? Because they're experiencing sorrow for sin. And God works with these individuals in a very powerful way. Step number three. The next R we have in our list here is reverse. So you can't just receive the message and have remorse. You also need to turn and reverse your course. We are told that when the sinner is truly sorry for sin, he will have a change of mind about his course of sins. We are told in Matthew chapter 21, 28, What think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go, to, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. There we go. He had a change of mind. So this son says, no, no, I'm not going to do that. And then he thought about his course and he says, I should. I should. 
he turned. So what happened here? He had a change of mind. So in a sense, this is repentance in practice. Yes, you were going one direction. Yes, you had one attitude about God. Yes, you thought about your heavenly father's message as insignificant. You didn't care too much about him. You didn't care about the cross of Christ. But something happens inside of you. You were convicted, touched by the Spirit of God. You felt that you were wrong. And then what did you do? You repented and went the other direction. This is what God is looking for today. And there are so many of us who are listening to this message as I speak today. You need to repent. There might be some things you are doing, practicing in your life, and God is not a plea, is not happy with you, and you know it in your spirit. Listen, friend, what I say to you, I say to myself, we need to repent. And I'm going to highlight some things as we go on. Let's go on. In 1 John 3, 4, we are told who's going to commit sin, transgressive also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. It is the law of God that has been transgressed, not, both, not just by the people in the world, but the people in the church, in God's house, with people who claim to believe, to believe in him, religious people, Christian people. We are also in need of repentance. There needs to be a turning, a changing of the mind, a changing of the course and going back to doing things God's way. Step number four, reformation. The sinner will also have a change of life. He will produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You see, when repentance takes place in the heart there will be a reformation in a life. We are told in Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What's going on here? A transformation is taking place. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. So you have two options. You can conform or you can transform by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In Matthew 3, verse 8, we are told, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance uh, not not these type of fruits no 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 the bible is talking about the fruit of the holy spirit love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control against such there is no law we are told in first corinthians chapter 6 know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of god and be not deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkard nor revilers nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of god in today's culture they say oh man that's somebody as sexual orientation. Listen, the first categories of sin that is clearly highlighted here, they are all sexual sins. First, fornication, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind. Listen, any sexual sin you can think about, whether it's homosexuality, transgenderism, lesbianism, whether it is effeminate, self-abuse, masturbation, pornography, a uh, 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 child molestation, friends, you name it, it is all condemned by the word of God. And he said, I don't care what the culture says. We live in a culture today. You know, you can't say stuff like that. You're going to make somebody mad. Listen, friends, is this the word of the Lord or is this the word of a man? The, just in case you misunderstand what I'm saying, let me read the first part of the text. For those of us who are extra sensitive, let's go to the word. We are told, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me explain to you what this means. You are not going to heaven if you remain in these sins. And I know I'm tearing on this text a little bit because we live in a society today, especially in the West. We think we can sanitize, we can sanitize sin. We think we can justify it and purify it because of the culture. I understand the culture. I respect the culture. But the message of repentance penetrates to the culture. And he calls the sinner, irrespective of who he is, how high he is, how respectable he is, how much money he has. If these things are in the life, he needs to turn or he's going to burn. And this is why, friends, you cannot sugarcoat this message. And this is why people got their head cut off. This is why, you know, uh, uh, Isaiah was sown in half. This is why Jeremiah was thrown in a well. This is why the prophets were persecuted back then. You think it's an uncomfortable uncom message? You think it's friendly? 
No, it's not friendly. And yet, it's an appeal of love, even though it is highly misunderstood. So people are going to get upset and say, oh, are you bashing people? Oh, oh, no, no, no. The Bible is calling sinners to repentance or else they're not going to be saved. So am I supposed to keep quiet about that? We are told no thieves, no covetous, no drunkard, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Stop stealing. Stop coveting what doesn't belong to you. Stop drinking alcohol. Reviling revilers and extortioners, taking advantage of those that who not understand. There are different ways some of us are guilty of these sins and we need to repent. And here is the good news. Here is the good news. Here is the good news. In the Corinthians church, all these people existed. Paul went on to say, such were some of you. But you are washed and you are just sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. We should be very grateful. They were in these conditions, but they've repented. And today, there is hope for you and I who are caught up in these sins. And I don't care about your intellectuality, your degrees, your finance. God is no respect of persons. I don't care how high you are, what's your level of spirituality, what's your position in the church, in the world, whether you are a president, a senator. If you are caught up in these sins, you need to repent. If you don't turn, you're going to burn. In Psalm 34, we are told, Come ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What many is he that desireth life and loveth many days, that he may see good. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Ephesians 4.28 Let him that steal, steal no more. Get yourself a job. Stop robbing people. Right? Stop walking to people's stores and walk out with the goods. And then you want to talk about social justice reform or criminal just reform. That, that's not going to save you if you remain in these behaviors. We are told, rather let him labor working with his hands the things which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Easy money. Selling drugs, selling dopes so that you can get ahead of somebody else in the process you're destroying other people's lives. You need to repent from that. Drug addict, drug dealings, this stuff needs to stop. Because if you plan on going to heaven, that needs to stop. We are told when the people in the book of Acts heard the message of repentance and felt the remorse and, and felt the need to turn their ways they took off their books and they were practicing witchcraft. They burned the books. That is what repentance looked like in practice. I remember one day, I used to be a very big video game player. You probably don't know this, all right? You probably want to believe me. <laughs> so early in my Christian experience, the first two years of my Christian life, I used to play, you know, uh, this NBA 2K and uh, Call of Duty kind of guy and but the Lord laid it on my heart. Burn the PS2. That was a PS2. We're talking about far back, right? Burn it. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. I said, Lord, I don't know if I can do it. So I took the games. However, I smashed the game. So I kept the system. So I was using the system for videos, for YouTube, and different things like that on PS2. And something else happened. <laughs> Somebody come in my one-bedroom apartment. Out of everything that I had, they stole the PS2. <laughs> stole it. Praise the Lord, I'm free. <laughs> Praise the Lord, I'm free. Friends, I am telling you, that's what repentance looked like. No, I did smash the games, yeah. I did get rid of it, but it was a partial repentance. The Lord told me to burn it. I didn't want to burn it. Somebody stole it. <laughs> so the Lord finished the work for me. And I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. When a person repents, there are things in your life that are binding you to certain practice and sin. You have to get rid of them. Those magazines that have naked women, you got to burn them. Do you hear what I'm saying? Those stuff on your phones that you are watching, that you know the Lord is not happy with, you need to get rid of them. You might have to put a code or uh, uh, find a ways to bind yourself away from that. True repentance 
really is a changing of the direction in which you are going. That means instead of going to the liquor store, go somewhere else. Instead of eating certain food that you know violates God's health, go eat somewhere else. Make some changes to show you bring in full fruit meat for repentance. Is that serious of a thing? So it's not a matter of what I think. Yeah, that's what it begins. But there are things around you that you need to get rid of. Listen, friends, there are some movies I had to throw in the trash. There were some tapes that need to be burned. There were some books that I had to get rid of. I didn't even want to take them to the store. I said, Lord, they belong in the trash can. I don't want anybody else to sin the way they caused me to sin. This is when you mean business with God. And this is what God is looking for. We are told in Acts 19, many that believe and came and confess and showed their deeds, my dear friends. They showed their deeds. That means they're showing why they really believe. Many of them which had used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. This is what I'm talking about here. And they counted the price of them and found them 50,000 50,000 pieces of silver, so mighty grew the word of God and prevailed. This is what repentance looks like in practice, my friends. We are told in, in, in Proverbs 28, 13, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. So you can confess your sin, that's one thing, but do you forsake your sin? Have you done that? Forsake. Break up. There must be a divorce between you and the sin. Restitution, somebody. So the last but not least is restitution. Repentance. Re the repentance sinner at this stage will seek to restore and make right his wrong as much as possible. That's right. We are told in Revelation 6, 4, and 5, uh, I mean Leviticus Leviticus 6, 4, and 5. I just can't read this letter. Uh, then it shall be because he have sinned and is guilty and he shall restore that which he took violently away and the things which he have deceitfully gotten and that which was delivered unto him to keep and the lost things which he found are all about which he have sworn falsely he shall even restore, here's the word, restore it in the principle and shall add to the, uh, it shall add the fifth part more thereto and give it unto him to whom it pertaineth in the day of his trespass offering. So when you've sinned and your sin has made an impact on the life of others, uh, taken away from others in a negative way, you need to make Restitution, restoration. We are told Zacchaeus is an example. In Luke 19, the Bible says, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the good of my, I mean, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by a false accusation, I restore him full, fourfold. And look how Jesus answered that. Jesus said unto him, this day salvation comes to this house. For as much as he is also a son of Abraham. When Jesus saw Zacchaeus making restitution, he said, I need to pay back what I've done. I, I owe some people, I have done some evil that I need not only to repent in my mind, I might have to do something to restore. Ezekiel thirty three fifteen. if the wicked restore the pledge and give again that which he had robbed and walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall live. He shall not die. This is what we are told. Restore. Make a pledge. Mary Magdalene. Oh, yeah, man. Did she make some restitution for her sins? Yes. She took the price of an oil, which was worth the salary of a year, washed the feet of Jesus with her eyes, 
and dried him with her hair and anointed his feet with oil. Friends, this was serious. This was an act of restitution on her, on her part. We are told in Luke 7 verse 47, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. For to whom little is forgiven, the same love if little. We are told she loved much. And when you love the Lord for what he's done, you will do much to show that you truly love him. You will make restitutions. And we are told today there are several ways you can do that. You have to restore. You have to serve, care, invest, give, minister, preach. Part of the restitution is that you have to do an act of service for God. You got to get involved in God's church. You have to get involved in ministry. And if there are people that you wronged, my dear friends, you might have to go and meet them where they are. And I'll tell you something. Let me pause to say this. What happens during COVID-19 and the policies of the church, some restitution needs to be made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can't just overlook that matter. Some people lost their jobs. Some people passed away. That those words on that outcome statement has cost people their jobs. You can't just move on. For, let's move on. No, 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 no. We need some restitution. And I'm not trying to burn down the church. All I'm simply saying is you can't just forget about it as if nothing has ever happened. That's not all right. There has to be some restitution. And I'm calling for it. Psalms 51, we are told, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. So what areas in your life is God calling you to repentance today? We are done. Sexual sins, impenitence, substance abuse, Rage, anger, immorality, self-righteousness, unforgiveness. What areas in your life is the Lord calling you, calling me, calling us as a people to repentance? Oh, repent now before it is too late. Repent now before it is too late. Question number seven. We are done. What should be the essential motivation for one to repent? What should motivate you to repent? We are told, is it negative outcomes? Are you afraid of what the results of your sin have caused? That can help, but that should not be the primary motivation. What about hell? Are you afraid of going to hell? Should you repent because you're afraid of burning? I mean, to a degree, but that should not be primary. What about the bliss of heaven? I want to be in heaven. Yeah, that's also good. But this is not the primary function, motivation for repentance. Job understood it. And this is what Job says. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, and now mine eyes see of thee. Wherefore I abhor my sin myself and repent in dust and ashes. What motivated his repentance here? The glory of of God, the majesty of heaven. Next, Isaiah said this, In a year of King Uzariah died, I saw also the Lord seated upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his strain filled the temple. What motivated his repentance? He saw the Lord, high and lifted up, his majesty, his glory. We are told in Isaiah 6, 5, then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, we are told. And I dwell in the people with unclean lips, of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He saw something. And the Bible says his sin was purged as, as after the angel took the piece of coal from the altar. And now here is the thing. What motivates them for repentance? It was the love of God, my friends. The glory of God, the majesty of God, they saw an image of God's love. That was the call to repentance. So the love of God above everything else should be the motivation 
to repent. We are told in John 15, greater love hath no man to dance than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Because of that love, we must repent. We are told in Zechariah 12, verse 10, I will pour upon the house of Israel, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, and he shall look upon whom they have pierced. Haven't we pierced Jesus? And they shall mourn for him as one mourning for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So why should I repent? The answer to that is because we have pierced him. The magnitude of the love of God should motivate the sinner to repent. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed on him, if you continue my word, then you add the supposed indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Friends, I hope you have received the message of repentance today. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. We love you and we praise you. Forgive us, Father, for our sins. Like the psalmist says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thought. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me into the way everlasting. Do the same for every single person watching today. Mixed multitude, wheat or tares, in the church, outside of the church, apostates, unbelievers, whoever they may be that are watching this message at this time, please lead each one of us to repentance. That iniquity might not be all ruined. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Okay, friends, thank you for listening. I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one. Bye.